morning and welcome to Shawnee. My name is Bonnie Beverly. I'm the branch manager here at the library. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the new things that we're doing here. We recently started an initiative to combat the issue of kindergarten readiness in Louisville with increased literacy skills called A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten. We hope to get every child in the city to have read a thousand books before they enter kindergarten. I know this sounds like a lot of books, but every time you read a book to a child, it counts as another book. I'm sure all the parents out here know that kids love repetition and want to read the same book over and over again. So know that each time you read that favorite book, it counts as one more book towards that thousand. So, before you leave today, be sure to come see me and register any grandchildren, nieces, nephews, children, to get them started on that path of literacy and academic success. There are pamphlets at the book sale table to my right to register. And speaking of the book sale, all profits from that book sale do go to support the Friends of the Library who are hosting this program, so please stop by and support them. Our book sale is also ongoing, so it will be available the next time you come visit us. So please enjoy this signature event for Black History Month, sponsored by the Friends of Shawnee Library. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Nora Couch, President of the Shawnee Friends. Mesa Smith, Assistant President. Marilyn Johnson, Secretary. Jesse Stokes, a Correspondent Secretary. Carolyn Harris, Treasurer. Beverly Owens, Beverly Parr, Louise Harris, Mary Walker, Margaret Harris, Lisa Holly, Martina Ross, Martina Ross, and Marie Weapon. And I'd also like to mention to uh, share with you all that one of uh, some of you I know know of Miss Ann Downs, who was a long term member of this group and uh, I guess about a month or so since we were last year here last, she passed on. So just want to share that with you all. Change. 
if only we believe. It's been a long, long journey, and we've fought the test of time. God gave us leaders such as Dr. King to try and help mankind. The torch has been passed from you to me and so on down the line, with each one making the way more clear till a better path we find. The people of this world all stand in need of some kind word or thoughtful deed. We can all make a difference. It's not hard to conceive if we just trust in God and only believe. Thank you. Oh, African-American neighborhoods in what we think of as the old city of Luke. Now, that is a, here's the way I approach this whole topic, both city and county, African-American neighborhood. Here's the way I approach it. I basically came up with a very simple notion. I did most of my research at the archives of the Jefferson County Public School. Here's why. Because the presumption is that in virtually every case, if you're going to go to elementary school, you're going to walk there. And if after, during racial segregation, if African Americans had a school they could walk to, you can reasonably presume there was a goodly number of African Americans who lived fairly nearby. Okay? If there has to be an operating thesis for this talk, that's it. And there's no other. I went to the Jefferson County Public School and I asked some very, very simple questions. And those questions were, where were the schools during racial segregation that you could walk to, both in the city and the county? And I came up with a goodly number of lists. And obviously, this is a moving target. Can we agree on that? Depends on what, uh, what year you put your finger down. But nevertheless, generally speaking, here are the kind of conclusions that I drew. Number one is there was a, always a goodly number of African Americans living west of 32nd Street in Parkland, uh, west of 32nd Street, headed down towards Southwestern Parkway, if not fully reaching there. And going down into the valley of Old Paddy's Run, that's where Shawnee Expressway now runs, just this side of Greenwood Cemetery. Um, that was a zone of pretty persistent and consistent African American residents. There were two schools. The one school was historically a city school. It was the Virginia Avenue Colored School. West End School is there now on Virginia Avenue at 32nd. Um, and so it's there. And it was Virginia Avenue Colored Elementary School, now Jesse Carter, or later Jesse Carter, and then, and now West End School. So that's, you can presume there were, and Black Parkland, we called it, uh, many called it, and that was a residential neighborhood where there were alleys, city-fied, Alleys, city-fied sidewalk, city-fied houses built standard side by side, about the same amount of setback, and front porches. A traditional city neighborhood, Black Parkland, along Dumont Hill, along down, uh, north to Garland, just about. That was Black Parkland. But then on 34th Street to this day, if you are southbound, you will notice that the street goes downhill towards Southern Avenue. When you go down that hill from Alton Garden, you have entered historically a different world. A world that was historically called uh, Little Africa. Little Africa did not have sidewalks. It did not have street. It did not have paved streets. It frequently had outhouses. It frequently had a garden. It frequently might have had a big outback. Uh, and it had a school. The Parkland Colored Elementary School. There in the heart of Little Africa, which was essentially Algonquin Parkway toward uh, um, getting close to Greenwood, I guess you would say. Um, no, not to Greenwood. No, it's getting close. Not even getting that far. Um, um, just beyond Southern, uh, Southern Avenue. So that's Little Africa. So there's a school there, absolutely. And the Parkland Colored Elementary School was closed in 1954. Now, around the city, there were others. Among them, that would keep me a surprise to me, would be the African-American school called Charles Young in the Portland neighborhood? Hello? Portland's a white neighborhood. Oh, I don't think so. Not in the 2700 block of life. 
And that's where the colored school, the African American school called Charles Young, named by that name for that Kentucky born African American, who was the third African American graduate of West Point and who became head of ROTC at Little Force University. Charles Young African American School in the Portland neighborhood? What about Benjamin Banneker Colored Elementary School? In the Butchertown neighborhood? Just off of Adams Street? Washington Street extended beyond Adams, it's historically called Maiden Lane, and if today you get off of Interstate 64 and go on to Melwood Avenue, you're looking on your right shoulder into the schoolyard of ben Benjamin Banneker Colored Elementary School? Uh-huh. Where the, where the uh, Boys and Girls Club was there on Melwood Avenue. That was the site of the old school. And who was Ben? You know who Benjamin Banneker was. He was that co-designer of the plan for the city of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, right, with Lampard. And so, therefore, that was, oh, what about the African-American school uh, at Hazelwood? Hazelwood? Now, it only operated until the 1930s, but it was very, very much there um, uh, on Gagel at Schlein. Um, there was an African-American church still there. Uh, on the way to St. Mary Elizabeth's Hospital up on Taylor Boulevard, for crying out loud. How about the, uh, how about the, the African-American school at South Louisville? The Georgia Ann Moore School. There's a, that's where you park when you go to Churchill Downs on Derby Day in South Louisville, right? In that neighborhood, which is white and black historically, called House South Louisville. It used to be a separate town, for crying out loud. And so there was an African-American school there as well. Or at the end, you go to Papa John Stadium, take Floyd Street on to its dead end, and there's an African-American community historically. All of that's now been totally leveled for airport expansion. But there was an African-American school at Highland Park. Or at Fort Hill in the Bottoms neighborhood. You're standing on the third floor of Manuel High School and you're looking toward I-65. You're looking across underneath, around, beside I-65, a neighborhood, African-American neighborhood called The Bottoms, and then up the hill to Fort Hill, and what's the African-American school in that neighborhood where the Red Cross Hospital was for many, 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 many decades? It was Abraham Lincoln, and it's still there, but it's now, of course, a racially integrated school, but that's African-American community in the city, um, in, um, in the Fort Hill and Bottoms neighborhood. Um, about the George M. McClellan School. Huh? It was a combination of African American residents in the Cabbage Patch. We now call that area of Park Hill, I guess, generally, don't we? The Cabbage Patch and the Bingham neighborhood. The Bingham neighborhood is there. All of this is around, in front of, beside, and across the street from the White Castle at Algonquin Parkway in 7th. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. Well, that's the George M. McClellan School there on, uh, uh, there on, uh, on 12th. Um, and so it was, uh, McClellan had been the principal at old Dunbar School. And so as a result, he got that name. Um, and so, uh, uh, and then of course, in the old city, there were schools, in and around a concentration of African-American residents, which throughout the 20th century grew from closer to, I mean the 19th century, grew, grew from closer to downtown all the way to 33rd Street, along Madison, along uh, what's now Muhammad Ali Boulevard, along Chestnut Street, all along, and so in Lower Russell, there was an African-American school, um, and that school would have been called um, the, um, um, the um, uh, James Bond School. Salisbury and James Bond is a combination um, to end up being Vic Elementary School. But James Bond, who was that uh, advocate for interracial co co uh, cooperation through the YMCA, um, and so uh, that school was originally at 29th and Cedar, or the middle, middle Russell neighborhood, 1500 Magazine, uh, African American school there. Samuel Taylor Coleridge School, historically not in its present location, 
but still in the Russell neighborhood. He was that biracial child of British parents, one from Africa, one from Britain, who was a composer of music, um, orchestral music, and so uh, very, very important. Are the Paul Dunbar School at the upper, in Upper Russell, named for that most successful poet author um, who had um, who had died in the early 20th century, or in the Limerick. Limerick? That's all Irish, isn't it? I don't think so. Not the Limerick neighborhood. Why, the African American higher education had been there on the corner from 1879, but just one block further west was the Mary B. Talbert School, and the Mary B. Talbert was a New York uh, anti-lynching, women's club advocate um, in the African American community, and also a strong advocate of prison reform. All of these, all of these, oh, forgot, the whites, no, the blacks in the California neighborhood, historically called California neighborhood, California Colored School, and then Phyllis Wheatley after the, after the poet, the African American poet of the Revolutionary Era. And so um, uh, the, that school would have been there as well. And let me say, I noticed some name changes, two strong African American educators beginning in about 1912, started petitioning the board of education in the old city saying, we need to start naming our, renaming our schools after leaders of our race, nationwide. And so you get a Paul, you get a Paul Dunbar, you get, a, uh, you get local educators like a McClellan, or you get a Phyllis Wheatley. Um, these schools were renamed in the World War I era after race leaders. And so you have, now, real quick, and moving very, very quickly. Oh, I forgot Booker T. Washington did that. They're in the, uh, they're in the Smoketown neighborhood, of course. And that had been, that school had been there originally, Eastern Colored School. Well, we agree that Central Colored School was the beginning of Central High School, and that building's still standing there on the uh, southeast corner of 6th and Kentucky. Uh, they're in the Limerick neighborhood, for crying out loud. Um, and, and then, of course, Frederick Doug Douglass, uh, Colored Elementary School, which would have essentially been east downtown, uptown, uptown, is that, uh, is that an appropriate phrase? And what's now the medical center, all right? Uh, Frederick Doug Douglass Colored Elementary School. Now, Southwest, let's, let's talk about the county. Now, this is what, and frankly, this is what surprised me most. I know African Americans in Petersburg, we may call it Newburgh in modern times, but I promise you the African American community was not Newburgh. Newburgh was a white rural community, a feed and seed community at the intersection of Poplar Level and Old Shep. But Petersburg, where the African Americans, some of whom were descendants of Eliza Tevis, um, and uh, her husband, uh, who lived on the back, back side of Bashford Manor Plantation, and that was the beginning of the Newburgh neighborhood, which took its name from Peter Law and became Petersburg, and that's that Indian Trail, Newburgh Road area. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beginning of the, of the Petersburg neighborhood. Well, of course there are African Americans. There in the been since the beginning of time. And you're going to have a school there called the Newburgh College School, right? Are you all, we, we all know in the suburbs there were African Americans near Jefferson Town, right? And so you're going to have a Jefferson, uh, um, Alexander Ingram, ultimately Alexander Ingram, Ingram Colored School, they're in racially segregated <coughs> Jefferson Town. But, yeah, what about the African American schools in the southwestern part of the county? The one that survived well into the mid-1950s. At O'Rell, along Dixie Highway, outside the Snyder Freeway, the O'Rell colored around Meadowlawn Baptist Church. It began at Meadowlawn Baptist Church originally. Am I telling you something you didn't know? Oh, you know all this. <laughs> but the O'Rell colored school, or the one that was burned by the Klan in the in the in the World War One era on Johnson Town Road, west of Dixie Highway, toward what's now the Riverport. Are the African American school that existed into the 1930s on Lower Hunter's Trace? Are the African American school? Somebody's got to remember this. I don't know if you're old enough. You got to get old. But what about what about Christus Attucks? 
Colored Elementary School on Bells Lane, near the old Bon Brown Brothers uh, creosote factory. Huh? It was destroyed by the 1937 flood. <coughs> and yes, there was one on Cane Run Road earlier, but Christus Attics survived into the 1930s in the southwestern part of the county. Christus Attics, named for that 1770 for early African American who fell during the Revolutionary War. South Park. Colored Elementary School. On National Turnpike? National Turnpike near Fairdale Road on Shaker Lane? Hello? <laughs> South Park. Uh, oh, oh, it was renamed. That's why I fouled you up. It was named Julius Rosenwald Colored Elementary School. Hello? You know who Julius Rosenwald was. That Jewish president of Sears and Roebuck who out of Chicago literally endowed in a matching dollars the recreation and the improvement and the building of new segregated African American schools in the South from the World War I one era well into the 1930s. <coughs> the local community, the African American community, the Board of Education would do a match with Rosenwald funds and they would improve black schools mm -hmm. in the South, in Kentucky, mm -hmm. in Jefferson County, well, they renamed the school at South Park in the Fairdale neighborhood, the Julius Rosenwald School. Hey, have you? Have you? Along Cooper, Cooper Chapel Road? The black church and the black school? To my knowledge, it may still be standing if, if uh, the, the project that we, uh, uh, we approved at the council did not make it during the economic hard times. But there on the uh, southeast corner of Manslick Road in Smyrna. Anybody know where I am? Well, that's the Meadowlawn African American School, the Meadowlawn Colored Elementary School. Uh, and it was called Pleasant Grove. Uh, not Meadowlawn, it was called uh, Meadowlawn on South Dixie. It was Pleasant Grove Colored Elementary School. I read the same newspaper you read, and I read this, and I didn't believe it, but I went to the school records and confirmed it. There was a newspaper story about 10 years ago of a, of a woman who was in their 90s who went to the uh, black school at Cannons Lane in Frankfurt Avenue? Huh? <laughs> Called Gutigs? G-U-E-T-D-I-G, -E after, uh, after the German immigrant owner of the tavern at that intersection? The Gutig County School? Color Elementary <laughs> School? Cannons Lane? Candace Lane and, uh, and African Americans who lived on farms, large farms, uh, who were truck farmers or tenant farmers, they walked to Budix from Indian Hills, for instance. Hello? She ain't many crickets. Here's the one that knocks my socks off. If I say Darcy Lane, does that mean anything to you at all? Yes. All right, you're coming from Anchorage on Darcy Lane. Now, you're just one long block beyond Hurstburn Parkway on Shelbyville Road. And you're coming from Anchorage. And, oh, I'm sorry, your brakes failed. And you luckily were able to run through the intersection, the light, at Darcy Lane and Shelbyville Road. Your brakes failed. You flew across, luckily, you flew across Shelbyville Road, hit the ditch, flipped up into the front yard of Darcy Colored Elementary School. And that school was open until 1961? Oh, wow. Hello? <laughs> ever loving, ever loving. You see? You see what peeling back, peeling it back just a little bit can, can do. It was also called Rosedale because there was an African American settlement there on Shelbyville Road. Uh, you know where the parklands are? You're out there, way out Shelbyville Road, almost to Shelby County. Uh, and it, it, the community is called Eastview. And down toward Fisherville, just out of Eastview, there was an African American school that was very, very close to what would now be called Beckley Station Park, uh, as part of the parklands at Floyd's Farm. And it was called Eastwood Colored Elementary School. And it closed in 1939. Unless there had been African Americans in Eastwood, at Eastwood, there would not have been a school, I promise you. Can we agree on that? Yeah. All right. And then, of course, 
uh, we know the African American communities between Middletown and Anchorage. Two schools, uh, one Ribby Town Colored Elementary School, yeah, and one Berry Town Colored Elementary School. Uh, it had actually moved up LaGrange Road from way out at Pitt Lane, almost to Shelby County. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, it was there, um, uh, there on LaGrange Road, and that school was there until, from the way I measure time, the day before yesterday. Part of First Baptist Church at, Bar at Barrytown. It was their Sunday school annex. There on LaGrange Road at Anchorage. You know what I'm talking about? That neighborhood, Barrytown, had been named for an early African American landowner in that area. And there were a goodly number of people employed in domestic service in the Anchorage area, as well as the quarry and along the L and Railroad line to Cincinnati, who worked in that area. In addition to in, in addition to that, um, uh, Barrytown and Griffithtown. Oh, yeah, um, uh, over on uh, over at Worthington. Anybody know where Worthington is? Yes. Have you ever been to Summit? The shopping center called the Summit. You ever heard of Darton Commons? All that's out there on Highway 22, and in this case, right beyond the Snyder at Chamberlain Lane, there was an African American school uh, there at uh, at Worthington, uh, gathered around a little rural community. Uh, actually, the African American school had moved from way out at Hit Lane, had moved up to Worthington when they built a new white school in about 1915. And then, of course, the one you just read about in the newspaper very, very, very recently, uh, there in Harrods Creek, Prospect, Jefferson Jacobs School. It was built with um, funds from the Rosenwald Fund in about 1915, 1918, 1917, and was a consolidation of the black school at Prospect and Harrods Creek. And we think that two-story school building is going to be restored partly out of mitigation funds associated with building the East End Bridge. Hello? <laughs> Crazy. It's now owned by um, a surviving group of uh, African American members of a Masonic Lodge. And then finally, the Harrison Kennedy School, which was named for uh, one of the trustees who lived up at Harris Creek. And that school was on the, the point there on River Road. Um, and when they closed that school after the flood, all the kids from Harrison Kennedy uh, started going to, um, uh, to school up in the Butchertown neighborhood um, there at, um, uh, uh, there at uh, um, the school there in the Butchertown neighborhood, Benjamin Banneker, of course. Well, I don't, didn't see a hand raised, but I think, uh, I think I can. Did you raise your hand? Did you raise your hand and tell me 25 minutes or uh, It's time to quit. I can tell you. Uh, but what, what have I said? What have I said to you all? I've said that the world, I think, for us all is full of surprises. And that as we live our lives, um, our stories are based on what's in front of us frequently. And the memory, though, of those surviving African American communities, um, in a time of significant change, um, during racial segregation, where there were teachers faithfully teaching 38 and 46 students in a one-room school in many, many cases, um, throughout Jefferson County and certainly within the old city, um, those folks are to be recognized and to be honored and to be remembered. Um, it was a very, very, very different time uh, but it chronicles, I think, a pattern of, interestingly enough, a strange, I'm not saying that it's rosy by any stretch of the imagination, but it was, it does chronicle in part, a level of integration um, that has not existed since integration. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that whites and blacks lived always comfortably side by side. But I am saying that there were enclaves, pockets of African American residents scattered around more broadly than I think we would simply acknowledge if we were just doing our history um, from straight in front of us. And I certainly mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much. I want to leave some time for you to ask questions.
the administration of the black schools, in not just the teachers and the principals, but was there a, a parallel part of, of Jefferson County Public Schools or whatever it was called at the time? Uh, Where there was, was not, no. It was, uh, it was administered, the schools were run by essentially white administration in the Jefferson County Public Schools. And similarly, that was true as well as in the, in the separate Louisville public school system. In other words, it came out of the same, the white system, administrators right. who appointed principals, teachers, and all, all of that. That's true. To my knowledge, that's true. Uh, now, the only thing that's causing me to pause about that is that at least in the county, some of those schools did have trustees. I, I better back off of that. I think that's true, but I'm not sure. Yes, ma'am. I see you on the left. There. Yeah, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Sometimes uh, in the schools, uh, although the Board of Education controlled them, they had other political situations that occurred in the community that chose the principal. I'm from Western Kentucky, and we know that there were key persons in the community who actually chose the principals for the African-American schools. And that wouldn't surprise me that that would be the case. And I'm struggling with this. I mean, for instance, Harrison Kennedy was a prominent resident of, Her of the Harris Creek community, an African-American, and his name was given to the school at the point. And I've read that he was a trustee of um, Jefferson Jacobs School. And I don't know what that really means. Uh, I'm just a little bummed. Yes, on on the edge there. I'm looking at you. Uh, <clears throat> maybe back then wasn't it all African American teachers teaching the African American? Absolutely. Yeah. And another uh, uh, <clears throat> point I want to try to make is like now we have busing, right? That's and right. the education system is kind of like poof yeah. all over the place because those teachers lived in the neighborhood, right? And the parents was able to see the teachers, and which could tell <coughs> on the students if they done anything. And now we don't have it. It's like our education system now has gone crazy, should we say. Because we don't have that hands-on with the teacher, parent, student. I, I, I think I agree with about 61%. 81%. Go ahead. <laughs> but I'll tell you the qualification. I've got a list in my backpack of the teachers um, in some of the county schools, mm -hmm. and many of them were in fact city residents. Uh, they, had paid, they took the interurban uh, to their jobs. So I don't think, I, I'm, only, I'm only qualifying and reacting to, I think it is possible that the teachers didn't necessarily live in those communities in every case. That's the only thing I'm qualifying. But certainly, certainly, the community, it was a, look, and I don't know if you're from rural communities or not, any of you, but I went to school in Owensboro for college, and many of the people I went to school with from rural Kentucky community had gone through in the 30s, 40s, and 50s consolidation of schools because, and that happened in the county school system as well. There were there was consolidation. Once you've got wheels with a with, with a gasoline-fired motor turning those wheels, then you can consolidate a school of 36 students with a school half a mile, two miles, three miles away. And so there was a consolidation process. But, um, so, but clearly, these were originally and continued in many cases um, walking accessible schools. There's no question about that. Yes, ma'am. The school I attended was the one you referred to out in the south end, out by racial, by Churchill Downs. Church Down. mm -hmm. The name of the school was Georgia G. Moore, That's right. named after black lady. Yes. It was a three portable school, <laughs> and the principal was the principal of Georgia G. Moore, and she was also the principal at Lincoln. Yeah. over in Fort Hill. Yeah. And so they changed back and forth. You know, she would go two or three days a year. But the thing about the community, and it's still the same, it, it was an integrated neighborhood of a sort. And right out our backyard was a two-story 
Haywood Elementary School. That when we were in our when we were in our yard, we could see the smoke coming from the school. And so the kids who all played together during school time, the white kids went to Haywood, and the African American kids walked a few blocks to the three portable school. But what was so interesting, eventually before they closed Haywood, I had an opportunity to teach in there for one year in this school that I had seen uh, yeah. all of my life. Haywood School is still there. Next time you park... Uh, uh, it's apartments. Yes, yeah, apartments. Apartment. And, uh, and uh, Georgia Moore, the site of Georgia Moore School, is now the Georgia Moore Park in uh, the South Louisville neighborhood. So there's a park there where the three portable buildings are. Uh, yes, sir. I, I heard you mention most of these schools are the location of elementary. Now, where do they do uh, post secondary or? I guess Going to high school. school. Well, there was one high school in the entire county for African Americans. <laughs> Um, and that is uh, Central High School, and the county school system would have paid tuition um, for, for county kids to go to the city segregated high school for blacks. They also, if you lived closer um, to Shelbyville Road Corridor, uh, they would pay you to be, um, to go to uh, the, the um, uh, Lincoln, 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 there at Simpsonville. What about junior high school? Yeah, they, were, they had junior high schools. Yeah, yeah. They had junior high schools. <laughs> well, um, um, Madison is now became, Madison Junior High became Russell. Um, Jackson Street. Um, I can't get there that fast. Uh, you all going to have to help me with that. How many other junior high schools were there during the The only two we just mentioned. Yeah. Jackson, yeah. Jackson, yeah. Jackson, yeah. Jackson, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, the gentleman in the black jacket. Let's do two more questions and I don't want to worry you out. Yeah. Okay. I, re I remember you were talking about Bond Brothers. Yeah. And Bond Brothers had his own community. Yes, yes. And we had to go to school in Overell. Down the road. Oh, you so, went all the way to Orel? From Orel. From yeah. Orel. From, from, from the top point. From the top point. Oh, yes, and I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that, yeah. That's because it was in the county. Yeah. And Christmas Addicts was closed during the, after the flood. Yeah. You don't remember Christmas Addicts. It was closed during the flood. And so you were bust to Orel. No, no. I, I, I need to tell you one thing. And I don't think anybody... Um, Anybody has, I hope this organization has patience. Uh, I had mentioned it to uh, my uh, council colleague, uh, Sherry Ryan Howard. Someday I would love the friend of the Shawnee Library uh, to show you uh, a homemade video. I think it's an iron commitment. So it's a lot. It'd be a commitment. It'd be a commitment. That has been done um, by um, a person I don't know. But I correspond with him every four weeks. Howard Breckenridge. Howard Breckenridge yeah. has done a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> grassroots personal video on with photographs and artist sketches and all of this, and has done it on Little Africa and the Bond Brothers Village that you're talking about, yeah. uh, that you're talking about. The Thai plant. Uh, the Thai plant. Yeah. His video includes both Little Africa and the Thai plant. It's right. hard, and to my knowledge, in Louisville, Kentucky, the only copy of that video that exists is on my desk. Um, I tried to get KET to take it, um, and they turned it down because it's a homemade video. You know, the the camera qualities and the audio qualities are inconsistent. But I'm telling you, it is uh, worth the squeeze. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, thank you very, very much. around the city and county.
bad for primarily for African Americans. I just certainly had no idea that they were scattered as far as southwest Jefferson County, far east Jefferson County. And so we just had a wonderful presentation. And I think our minds have been open as to what our community has been and what it is.